welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when I'm not talking on this podcast or writing about nutrition and endurance racing and all kinds of endurance stuff, I'm definitely outside doing one of those things. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm an endurance coach and a registered kinesiologist, and you are here on the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we talk to all different types of endurance athletes and people who go outside and do different things and we try and pull out you know things that we can use in our own sports and, and movements and daily lives yeah and this this was a good i'd say consummate athlete weekend for us uh last week i think it was wednesday afternoon our, our good friend eric who was actually on the podcast last year talking about um getting the fkt for the la Cloche silhouette trail in killarney um, and talking all about backpacking and camping invited us on a weekend long fast pack in Algonquin Provincial Park, which I'd never been to. So it was an 80 ish kilometer trail. And he was like, we'll leave Friday, we'll be back Sunday. And at first we were like, absolutely not. That seems ridiculous. We can't possibly do that in these next two days. Uh, and then five minutes later, I think I, I was the one that texted him back. Okay, so we're in. Um, definitely going to do that. And it was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, Eric was on, and there's lots, lots of good knowledge in that. Uh, it was more to the the sort of how do you camp and be outside, I think, was sort of uh, that that podcast that we did with him there last year, I guess. Yeah, so we'll link to that one in the show notes if anyone wants to go back to it. But yeah, the fall colors were in full force this weekend. We saw moose. Uh, we saw a lot of moose tracks, some bear poop. Um, yeah, it was just a really fun kind of adventure that was a little bit different than anything we'd been doing lately. We hadn't, I mean, I don't think our hiking packs have really come out since the last time we hiked La Cloche uh, last year. No, I don't think so. I feel like we did pull one out for some reason recently to haul stuff around, but um, no, we have not been backpacking. So that was good. And I think perfect for this time of year, you know, a lot of the summer athletes are, you know, sort of maybe through that break they they've taken a break from their sport, hopefully. And now you're sort of getting into that preparation or early base season and so this is sort of the what you want to be doing just sort of like a little bit of light movement you know not nothing to excess hopefully uh well i mean you're conditioned for 50k runs so i mean this wasn't so far beyond you're so. right a 50k pack with a 30 pound backpack on definitely super chill very light movement um, it was a hard weekend i'm not gonna lie but it was really it was really fun and it was good to get kind of that big change of pace um, and it, you're right, it was not outside the norm of like, what is a reasonable activity for us to do? Um, it's not like it was like, off the couch, let's go hike 20 miles. It was, okay, I've been running more than 20 miles very frequently, so packing shouldn't be that bad. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, really just getting ready for sort of, you know, maybe inclement weather, or maybe if you are doing some cross training, if you're thinking skiing, or you're thinking, you know, whatever type of things, or maybe you're looking for something, you know, I, I always say, you know, just going for a walk often solves a lot of problems. So, you know, even if you're in a city, just starting out and going for a walk, and then you can maybe make that longer or hillier or faster, you know, a little bit of speed walking, uh, or, or going to some sort of, you know, backcountry hiking day, even a day hike, right, and, and on the weekend. So keep that in mind. Um, it's quite enjoyable and you can do it with friends of sort of all different abilities. And yeah. Yeah. I think we, we kind of joked around about not really having like all the right winter gear or any of that stuff to go into it. But honestly, it turns out if you do, you know, any kind of endurance sport and you do it through the winter, you probably have enough gear to handle an overnight backpacking trip. Yeah, I think sometimes we stress over having that perfect thing, right? But I think backpacking, if any sport, is sort of open to not looking super fashionable, right? There's, you know, all different types are accepted, right? It's certainly not, you don't need to be super out there with anything, right? It could be, you know, your winter cross-country ski tights, or it could be, you know, it could be track pants. It could be, you know, really just looking for like a khaki type outdoorsy pant, right? So... I mean, I just wore tights. So that was great. As far as bottom layer. But yeah, we all have winter coats. We all have, you know, and, and certainly if you're not going super deep and into the wilderness, it doesn't matter that much, right? You have some sort of outdoors type clothing, you know, your cycling kit or whatever, you know, jackets and stuff like this whole, your raincoat is probably a great raincoat. Yeah, I definitely just, I felt like I got really hung up on gear and that was part of why I initially said no. And then I kind of thought through it and I was like, oh, you know what? We have packs, like we're going to be fine. Yeah, and I think, again, everyone's tolerance, both in terms of their body and their energy and gear and exposure and stuff is going to be different, right? So there's no no reason you can't go to your local, you know, provincial or state park and 
you know, jump out and go for, a, you know, a 5, 10K walk and you're really just walking, right? So, you know, for a lot of us, that's going to really push tissue as far as, you know, different muscles being used and different ranges of motion and yeah. And you'll find out your boots might not work or your shoes might not work for that. And maybe it's just adaptation or you need to look into the equipment. But I, I dare, generally like people to try stuff out with what they have first mm-hmm. uh, and then figure out sort of where those weaker links are, right? Mm-hmm. And versus I know you're very much the get all the gear before you start the activity. but Since I was like 10 years old, yep. Um, and actually to that end, if anyone wants kind of some... Uh, some tips on how, yeah, how to put together your high, uh, fall hiking gear without actually buying anything new. I'm doing a couple articles over on the outdoor edit this week, so you can go over there and just kind of keep an eye out. So that's the outdoor edit.com. Yeah. So today's guest actually, I think would have highly approved of our weekend. I'm going to say, since we did have, we did have a dog with us. Mm-hmm. We did. Yeah. So uh, those of you who are into running, the name Chris McDougall would not be, you know, particularly surprising to you. He's the author of Born to Run and Natural Born Heroes, one of my all-time favorite authors for sure. And he has a new book coming out actually next week, October 15th. That's going to be available, but you can get it for pre-order now. It's called Running with Sherman, and it's, you know, it's all about donkey racing, but there's Bur- a lot... Burrow racing, burrow racing. It's, but it's with donkeys. Yeah. With donkeys. But there's a... I guess maybe. Is it with burrows, technically? Yeah. I don't. I don't know if we get to the bottom of that, but it's called burrow racing, and it's essentially donkeys are used. Yeah, yeah. I think a burrow and a donkey are the same okay. thing. Okay. Apologies to the burrow slash donkey well, community if I have that. They're wrong. welcome to come on and tell us more specifics about the discipline. Yeah, I mean the book. I'll say so. I I got a copy and read it ahead of its publication date, and I'll say like it's not just for burrow racers. It's definitely something that everyone can read. It's a lot about you know, just sort of our relationship with animals and how we've kind of gone away from that, but how to sort of get back to it and how they can help with, you know, so many different things. Um, yeah, I mean, if you've, if you've liked Born to Run or Natural Born Heroes, you're still, you're going to love this book, even if you're like, I would never race a donkey. Mm-hmm. Although well, I'm definitely going to race a donkey. And a lot of people like Born to Run did tremendously well, right? A lot of people who never ran before and didn't run after. Some people got motivated to try because mm-hmm. of it. Um, but certainly it appealed to a pretty broad audience. Yeah, it's funny. I always joke, I'm super impressionable when it comes to reading. I mean, I read Babysitter's Club as a kid and I babysat. I read Born to Run and I signed up for a trail marathon the next weekend Uh, not signed up for one the next weekend, meaning like signed up for one that was like a year later, like signed up for one the next weekend. Right. Because I was so excited by reading it. Not an advisable idea, but still really, really fun. Um, Yeah. So I think it's, it's a really fun episode. We, we get into if I need a donkey or if I need a dog. I think Chris is another one with the vote firmly in the Molly gets a dog in 2020 category. Right. So that means I love this episode. I think most people will. And definitely, you know, check out Pre-Order Running with Sherman. It's an awesome book and a great read. All right, let's dive in. Enjoy this episode with Chris McDougall. Chris McDougall, you've written, you know, some of the greatest books on running and adventuring that I've ever read. And I think most people have read you, you know, made me run a trail marathon. I'm going to say it's your fault that I'm an ultra runner now. So <laughs> um, yeah, very excited about this. We have not yet bought a miniature donkey now that I've finished reading your new book. Um, let's let's start with actually, what have you been up to in the last year? Because the donkey racing had happened, you know, obviously you wrote the book or you raced and then you wrote the book and now you've had kind of some time to, you know, muse on it. So what's, what's been going on? Yeah, it's weird. You know, once you get down that rabbit hole, same way you did, once you got into trail running, like there's no turning back. Yep. And with me, it was uh, with the donkeys, you know, once we started um, running with the donkeys, you can't stop for basically for two reasons. One is because they don't want to stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're literally, as, as we're talking, I'm looking at them, they're standing at the gate, all three of them <laughs> standing at the gate, looking at me like, dude, I see you. It's time to run. So once they realize like that's their playtime, they're mm-hmm. down, they're down for it every day. And also for me, it really profoundly changed my approach to running. And I wonder if it's not similar to what you experienced when you got on the trails that there's a different experience when you have another 
sensation going on when, when you're getting outside of your own preoccupations. Like when you're on the trail, if you're not paying attention, at some point you're eating dirt. You yeah. know, you're, you're you're making a mistake. And that's the thing about the trail, which is so cool, is it forces you to get outside. You're not thinking about your watch and your heart rate and your you know your Strava um, and the chores back home and the emails you didn't answer. You're like keeping your eye on your footing and the trail and the hash marks and what's going on. And with donkeys, it's that times a hundred because. If your attention strays when when you're running with your donkey, at some point, you know, he's jerking the rope out of your hand or going the wrong way or something. So that's the thing about it is it becomes a completely absorbing experience that you keep wanting to repeat. Yeah. Yeah. So have you been racing or have you just been running with the donkeys on a regular basis? Yeah, just running. And um, we're, we're, the problem with the racing is that it takes place about – 4,000 miles from home. Right. And, uh, yeah, and that's, that's, um, I, I don't know. I'm, I really, I really kind of, I'm really torn about that because the races are a trip and they're actually getting bigger all the time. So there used to be only like two or three in Colorado. And now there's like 10 different races and a whole new breed of runners has emerged, which is just, so cool that so many people who didn't think they were runners or didn't think they could handle donkeys, they're all getting to bar racing. Mm -hmm. And, and now I've become like a total like donkey racing nerd where I get a phone call from a friend all excited. Like, Oh, you won't believe, you know, Amber won, finished like third in Leadville, then in, in the short course race and Roger Pedretti's cousin from Jersey. And, and I'm like, totally into this like i'm like there's like baseball dudes who are covering stats like all the new runners <laughs> like, what they're doing on the trails like I, I can't get enough of it uh the only problem is that the, you know the ass ache of hauling three donkeys from pennsylvania to colorado and then from town to town and then back to pennsylvania is just it's more than i want to bite off any any particular summer i mean that just sort of sounds like you need to put together a donkey race in pennsylvania <laughs> it's not out of the question. It's, actually, as we speak, at this very moment, uh, one of my Amish neighbors is rolling down the road in front of me on, on a scooter. And I think that it's a better than 50% chance that I could set up a whole donkey racing series out here with, with Amish runners. If you set it up, I will rent a donkey and come out and run that for sure. No rental necessary, Molly. You have open privileges. You can get any one of these three ding dongs anytime you want. <laughs> Amazing. All yours. Yes, yeah. count me in, 100%. Um, one, right. of, one of these days, I'm, I'm going to get out there, and I really want to try this whole donkey running thing. After reading the book, I was very skeptical of it in the first few chapters, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but then by the end, I was I like, love yeah, it. I love, I love, okay. I love the fact that you come out, come out voicing your doubts right from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, eh, I mean, donkey racing, whatever. I mean, I felt the same thing, honestly, when I read Natural Born Heroes. I was like, parkour, whatever. And then next thing, I know, you know, I was, I think we ended up, I ended up going to the same parkour guy that you went to and, you know, the rest is history. So yeah, it's only a matter of time before we own donkeys. Poor Peter. I was All just right. like, I okay. just, Peter's like, I just barely said yes to maybe getting a dog and now you want a donkey? <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I'm trying to make this argument that anything you think you're getting from a dog, you actually get from a donkey. <laughs> um, or at least, you know, think about it. They, they don't bark. They don't really well, maybe I should maybe I should change it to goat. More like more like goat than donkey. I was gonna say they don't bite. Well, they kind of do bite. They do kind of bray. Goat. The goat's what you're looking for. You make that your starter animal. Well, Peter, I think Peter, Peter, you'd be okay with goats because then we could host goat yoga. So really, they're they'd be economically a much friendlier choice. And do our yard if we get a yard. I guess. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, Peter. Hello. Yeah. Um, I guess in line with that, I guess what I'm thinking here is we started down earlier, you guys, when you were talking uh, before we started recording, but the idea of the city to country, right? And we're seeing this, like people are leaving the city and bucking their wall street jobs and stuff to go to farm. And, and you're sort of expressing you're on the, the you know, the other side of that, perhaps um, what's, what's your, you know, having done a bunch of this now with the farming and the donkeys and stuff like what's, what's your your take, I guess, on this, like, we're all leaving the city and we're all going to start farming, but then, you know, you mentioned the chores and so forth. 
Yeah, the tours are the tours are all right. Um, it, it's a it's a funny thing. You know, it's been now t- almost twenty years for us. So, you know, maybe it's a natural evolution where, you know, there's some you know it's sort of a finish line where like yeah, all right, you know, I've lifted enough hay, I've cut enough firewood, this is good. Um, but for a, up until right now, <clears throat> for the majority of the time, I actually really looked forward to them. It was my it was the thing that got me out the door in a way that a regular workout never would. Mm-hmm. I, I, actually, I actually look forward to it. So, you know, if I'm inside working at my desk and I'm getting restless, I couldn't wait to run outside and, you know, grab the lumberjack saw and start cutting wood, splitting it and stacking it. And even in the wintertime, you know, you're like, yeah, you look outside, it's like gray and, you know, it's like that, that Pennsylvania, like, iron gray sky that just kind of locks in from February to March and and, and you have no daylight because you know sun's down at 435 but if the donkeys need water like all right man I'm strapping on the snowshoes I'm grabbing the five gallon buckets I'm walking down to the the creek I'm hauling buckets of water like I used to get kind of psyched about that so I I don't know I I had a friend come out from Philly uh, a friend from my Philly days came out and you know, she was doing the whole, like, well, you know, maybe it's good for you, but it's not good for everybody. And, you know, oh, I'll have the privilege of, you know, living in the country. I'm like, well, dude, I, yeah, I, no rain of gold dropped down from the sky for me either. You know, you, you make your choices and mm-hmm. you go with it. And, and so for the first 10 or so years we were here, it was some tough scratching, you know. It was hard making ends meet and and adjusting financially to a country move, but... Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's one size fits all at all, but if you can make the move, man, I think the benefits are just off the charts. It's funny. We, we go back and forth on it so often because with, with cities you get, you know, I mean, obviously country living has a sense of community, but in a city you could find pretty much anything that you possibly wanted as far as like, you want to pick up soccer game, you want to go play basketball, you want to find like you know, random trail runners, you want to find a road cycling crew, you can just find all of them really easy access in the city. And then, you know, you go out to the country and like, I'm an introvert by nature. So I would very easily, I think, go weeks without seeing people if we moved to where people weren't. (laughs) You know, I have to tell you, I'm the same way. And the only worry I have is that 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 doesn't bother me. So, um, Mm -hmm. and that's why, yeah, so to answer more specifically, you can kind of find what you want here too. So, and I think I'm, I'm about as extreme as it gets. We literally are surrounded by Amish farmers. Uh, mm-hmm. My nearest neighbors it, within, actually I can't see anybody. There's no, there no, there's no house within an eye shot of where we live. My nearest neighbors in every direction are Amish or Mennonite farmers. And yet there's a really vibrant trail running scene out here. Um, the, the cycling is crazy, uh, crazy good. Cause you can go, miles and miles, you know, without seeing a car go by. Um, and I don't know, man. I think that the stuff that everyone thinks they're getting from a city is kind of overrated because it was, oh, you know, we had the restaurants and the museums. Like, when was the last time anybody went to a museum? Nobody goes. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and the theater. Like, yeah, sure, you go to the theater. And then um, even restaurants, don't you tend to go to the same like maybe three places over and over again like one of you straight outside your like triangle of familiar restaurants mm-hmm. yeah i mean i guess you could just get them to freeze a bunch or like yeah order a bunch of takeout and just freeze it every once every few months so you have it for emergencies <laughs> <laughs> or, or dude no you just you just cook for yourself but i mean that's, that's oh. the end of so it, it was a big old jump for us you know we came here out of philly i, I lived in cities Without exception, my entire life, you know, yeah. I've never been further than a few miles from at least like one million people, and it was, I mean, you know, a step off the high dive for us. But I don't know. I mean, at this moment, I'm sitting on the porch in the sun. I'm watching the geese walk up the hill toward the gate. The donkeys are below. I don't know. Man. It's um, it's a kind of a nonstop vacation. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because, I mean, you wrote a bunch about this in the new book, and I felt like this book in particular, compared to your other ones, has a lot more personal narrative about your life and, you know, where you've come from and where you are now compared to the other two. Was that on purpose? Did you decide to do that, or did it just kind of naturally happen when you were writing it? You know, I'm actually really glad you asked that question because it's kind of a a writerly question, 
it's kind of like shop talk that I, I like to have, but don't get an opportunity to have. So, <laughs> you know, it's true. So, um, so I think most people just you, you, they read the book and they're they're taking in what's happening and they're not really sort of questioning uh, the mechanics behind it. But for me, that was a really big shift and not an easy one. You know, I came out of a, a hard news writing background. You know, I was a correspondent for the Associated Press and you're writing short, hard news briefs, like 500 words of, you know, economic changes in Portugal or, um, you know, Prime Minister's uh, State of the Union address. And to shift over to more personal writing um, wasn't easy. So in, in Born to Run, when I turned in the first draft, one of the first comments my editor made was, yeah, there, there needs to be more of you in this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I think there need to be le less of me. <laughs> you, know, you, got, you got Jen Shelton, like hurling chunks in my bathtub, and, you know, Billy Bonehead doing his stuff, and you got Caballo Blanco. I am hands down the, the least interesting person in this story. And my editor said, that's the reason why you need to be present, because you're the point of entry for the average reader. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not extreme people like the other characters. They, they need someone relatable. I heard it, and, and I made adjustments to Born and Run, um, which you see in the final version. And the Natural Born Heroes, we had the same conversation. And he's like, man, these are more of you. I'm like, I don't think so, dude. I got World War II resistance fighters. You know, I don't, I don't really measure up. So it's been a struggle. And finally, with this book, with Running with Sherman, I felt that there was no other way to tell the story than other, other than through my eyes. So mm -hmm. um, it, it was both the natural way to tell the story and uh, an adjustment I've been trying to make now for the past 10 years. I feel like it's it, the the editor is, is just like, oh, you need more, you need more personal stuff in it. You're like, hold my beer. This one's going to be, this one's going to be good. That's right. <laughs> you want personal brother? <laughs> I'm going to tell you about sticking my hand inside of a donkey's penis. That's a, uh, I got far I'm <laughs> Exactly. I read that. I was like, "Oh boy, we're we're going there. It's it's going everywhere." Yeah. I mean, it's <sighs> it's also I'm going to say like a really personal book in terms of the other characters too. It's not just, I, I mean, not to say that it doesn't get personal in Natural Born Heroes or in Born to Run, but this one I feel like it really gets into some some darker topics and like more serious topics that you know you could have kind of backed away from and you didn't. Yeah, you know, it's funny about that because I think that um, one of the, like, the sociopathic problems of being a writer is that you really do forget about other people's feelings while you're writing about them. And, you know, when I was doing Born to Run, I originally had this uh, epilogue, you know, this extra chapter I, I tacked on at the end of the book. And I decided not to actually use it, but not out of any kind of compassion or, you know, higher human feeling, which should have been my impulse, but because it just it felt extraneous, you know, it just felt extra. Yeah, you know, I think where, where, where Born to Run ends is where it should end, you know, it sort of dropped curtain. But mm -hmm. between, between the end of that race, the end of the book, and, you know, two years later when it was ready to be published, so much had changed in the lives of the people that I was writing about. Mm -hmm. So it was this epilogue with all the, all the drama in their lives. And my editor was like, eh, you know, that's too much, dude. It's like, it's becoming a soap opera. But uh, later on, I was talking to uh, Scott Jorg about that. And, you know, Scott was talking about some of the, the hard times he'd gone through in his own life. And I said, oh, yeah, that was in my epilogue. And he just looked like, dude, you were going to write that about me? I said, absolutely I was. But it, it never dawned on me that he might actually have some personal thoughts about that. But my feeling is that without even thinking about it, you know, your obligation is only to the story. Like you're just putting in everything that you know. And so for running the show, it was the same way. It never really clicked in my head that this is highly personal stuff and I should be sensitive about it. My, my, my guiding principle is, you know, you're fighting to get the best story you can and, and you don't really think twice about it until you're done, whether anyone's going to have any objections to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that makes this story much better. Like if I, if I kind of think about this new book and taking out all of the parts that are highly personal, I mean, you'd be left with like a really nice children's book about donkey running. Um, yeah. But, yeah. 
but that's definitely, you know, the really meaty parts are, you know, more of the human struggles. Well, and also the donkey struggles, I guess. But no, I, I'm hoping that's the thing that will keep me doing um, books that um, the people like is that I got to say, you know, in a lot of adventure and outdoor writing, it always feels a little sanitized, you know, you know, like it always feels like the writers come in with this uh, conception in their mind. Like they're going to be telling a heroic tale of, you know, their struggle against adversity and the human stuff like that. Well, you know, dude, you got a boyfriend, you know, or what did you have dinner last night? Or, you know, during the Iron Man, like, did you take a shit? And where? You know, so yeah. like, the, the, <laughs> the, the personal stuff that people want to know and that relates to their lives is always like sanitized out. So, um, I feel like if you can take one step closer to real life, you'll, you'll have a stronger book. Yeah, for sure. Like the, you can tell, you know, in those books, you can take like a page or two describing like popping a blister, but yeah, talking about like poop or your romantic life seems to be like that's that's over the line. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can sort of see why. You know, there becomes this cycle of a kind of story, and that, that same cycle just gets repeated over and over. So uh, it's kind of like sports movies. Like the majority of sports movies below, they're terrible. Because it's the same movie. It's just like, you know, oh, the underdog, and he tried, and he failed, but then he succeeded. Yay! And, and anything that's more human or real. Uh, that's why, like, every once in a while, a movie like, you know, like, White Men Can't Jump. It's like, he's off the screen because it's really human. Like, it's on a personal level. The guy's kind of a loser. He kind of remains a loser. He has one shining moment. That's why Rocky, I thought, you know, was, was so amazing, too. Mm-hmm. Kind of a complete loser. He never actually was a winner, you know, in, in the first Rocky. And so I think those kind of things where we actually show that the hero is not a saint. He's just a normal person and has an, an occasional uplift, but the rest of his life, is, his or her life, is still kind of gritty. Yeah, we were having a conversation about this recently just in, I guess, in the background of sort of social media and stuff and people not, you know, sharing purposefully or, or just because that's not the norm, you know, the the hard days or the you know, I got up today to go train and it was pouring rain. And I, like you say, there was some sort of pooping issue. Um, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't hear about those. And so we all have this like false sense that, you know, you just win automatically, you know, these people are just amazing and have no flaws. Um, and I'm yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, I'm sorry, computer, I was, cutting I was just gonna say, and that I think with Rocky or something like that, right. Is maybe something that's gotten closer to that. Like, yeah, you know, it, it sucked and he was poor and, you know, living basically on the streets like drinking, that drinking raw eggs. Yeah. He couldn't even cook his eggs. <laughs> yeah. That's how poor he was. Rough day. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He could not even apply heat to his food source. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think you're completely right. And I know where I love where I love and actually, uh, it's kind of a whole side issue, but, um, there's this ongoing conversation and effort to turn Born to Run into a, into a film. And in, in the conversations I've had with the screenwriters and the uh, producers, I've always pointed out that the really the best sports movies are about goals that people set for themselves. Like the, the, the sports films I really like are never about like winning the NHL championship. No, it's a dude saying, well, all I really want to do is this. Like the, the hero sets his or her own personal goal. And it's not like a championship. It's not really winning anything. Like for Rocky, it was just like, I just want to be not dead. You know, if I can just be alive at the end of the fight, that's a win. That's a win for me. With white, white men can't jump, the dude just wanted to dunk a ball. Like that was it. If I can just dunk, that's a win. And so I heard this quote. I'm going to try and track it down to earth. But someone said, the best races always start with a line drawn with your shoe in the dirt. And oh, I love that. I like that. It, it's like not the Boston Marathon. It's you and your Jaboni buddies on a Saturday morning. I tell you what, let's just see you get to the Wawa, you know, over in Avondale quickest on our bikes, you know, mm-hmm. and that's it. So anyway, that, that, that's what I, I think um, I'd like is if we could just distill it down to, hey, man, uh, I'm not superhuman. I'm just a normal person, and uh, if it's raining out, you know what? I'm not going to run. But on the days I do, you know, it'll it'll be it'll be glorious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and then to kind of come back to to the new book and sort of talking about that running in the rain or training when it kind of sucks. Yeah, I feel like in the book, um, training versus playing seems to be this really common thread, and 
you know, embracing this idea of play. Did the donkeys help you get to that point? I know you talk about a few ultra runners who have that and that's, you know, changed their careers. But for you, was it the donkeys? You know, it's funny that that mentality has become almost an obsession with me. And I'm really curious whether I'm on to something universal or it's just personal. Like I'm not, you know, it's like when you feel like you've got something figured out, but you're not sure if it's shared by the broader world and is, is like an objective truth or it's just my own personal preference that I, I, I care to project outward. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see how this mentality plays out. Cause I'm, I'm going to keep exploring it. But my thinking is just that is that, you know, the hardest workouts you'll ever have in your life will probably be in fourth grade, like on the playground for free all, you know, or sharks mm-hmm. and minnows. Like I never ran harder in my life than JV basketball in seventh grade uh, because it was, it was play. It was fun. Um, and we somehow taken fun and turned it into work. And I, I think that anything that is work, you, you tend to avoid and, and kind of dread and don't really put your heart into it. And what I found is that as much as you can put the playfulness back in and, and forget about performance goals, uh, the better off you are. And with the donkeys, like for sure, because you're not, you're not in control. You know, when you're out with the donkey, you're, you're hanging on, you're not really running the operation. Mm-hmm. And if the donkeys, if the donkeys aren't in the mood, they'll just shut it down, man. Like, you know, we're not having it today. Or if there's a pace I want to run and they don't, you know, guess who's winning that fight. So <laughs> what I like about it, you know, what I like about it is that it, it just becomes this thing where you have to adjust and go with the flow and, you know, and make it adaptable and, and changeable all the time. Mm-hmm. It's a difficult thing. You know, I, I'm a coach and that's what I do. Um, so it, it's trying to find that balance, right? People have goals, but then not, you know, they all started, we all started, you know, just riding bikes or running or whatever for fun, probably, right? There was probably a social element. And so trying not to like... Uh, maybe you did. I didn't. I guess. Why did you start? <laughs> uh, because I gained weight in college. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, and, and for those people, I guess those, those people exist too, right? Like there's this like really hard goal, but there's not really like a, a why or like what does today look like, right? And trying to find that joy. So, you know, maybe in the weight loss person, it's like finding that like, yeah, you got to go run because like your dog expects you to go run too and you enjoy, you know, being out. And it, it's a tough one, right? I think you're, you're definitely on to something as far as like how can that play be reconciled with any sort of long-term objective, right? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, and I'll, I'll contradict myself in, this, in the space of like a single sentence. You know, I'll be like, oh, there shouldn't be goals. I go, dude, your whole book is about, every one of your books is about a goal. What are you talking about? So, you know, I realize there, there's a, a conflict there between what I'm preaching and what I'm doing to a certain extent. And yet I feel like there's a consistency. Like I'm on, the, I feel like I'm not just blowing smoke. So, so with running with Sherman, I think maybe the best insight came from the, the person who coached me, Eric Horton. And, you know, it's funny with Eric, um, he gets really, I think, great performance results out of me, <clears throat> pardon me, but it never feels forced. You know, I never feel like um, pushed and yet um, escalating my stamina and speed really quickly and consistently and healthfully and um you know maybe peter what we're looking at is this is where the coach really steps forward because i think you know one of the things i remember eric telling me right from the get-go is that you know most people do their hard runs too easy and their easy runs too hard Mm -hmm. And, and maybe that's the maybe that's the problem right there is that if you're not really tapped in to how to maximize what your body can do, then you're always doing it. You know, you're pushing yourself too hard or too too easy, and that's where the discrepancy comes between achieving and, and pushing yourself. So, you know, what Eric did was, and always does, is like he's like, all right, let, let's find out where the goal is and work our way backwards. So, don't start today with what you think you can do. Like, hey, you know, what? I think I can run ten miles today. You know, maybe you don't need to do ten miles today. Maybe you just need to do two miles today. Like, find out what and where your goal is. So but your goal is to run 15 miles with a donkey in Colorado in nine months. Good. Okay. That's our, that's our end point. And let's work backwards to today. And, 
in that case, maybe the 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 um, daily workload is actually a lot lighter than people think. You mm-hmm. know, because if they're thinking, "Oh shit, Boston Marathon! Oh my God, it's going to be April. I better get out today and bust my ass." So, well, you don't, you don't need to bust your ass. You know, it works up gradually and smartly, as opposed to like frantically. Yeah, and I think the other piece to that that may be of assistance to you as you do think through this is, I think you you know obviously are excited about the race with the donkey. And so for you, when you backtrack that, you know, that's what we call point B, you're going to race in Colorado, the everything in between all those little steps, you're probably excited for. So it seems like play, like you're just going out and running with a donkey. That sounds playful, but you're excited for that. Right. Whereas if I'm like, I really hate donkeys (laughs) and running actually. He he doesn't hate donkeys in case they're listening. He loves donkeys. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like, so you've chosen a goal. Like we signed up for an Ironman and I wanted to learn how to swim, but I hate uh, riding in a straight line on pavement and I really don't like running on pavement. So I dealt with it and I learned to swim, but that would be a poor goal for me to do long term, right? It's just but I, you see people sign up for things where it's like, oh I definitely want to do an Iron Man. But, but they don't actually they don't have. actually want to go to a pool every day for the next years. Because right. it's terrible. So I wonder if that's part of your play and that's the reconciling of your play versus goal. Mm-hmm. is that the goal has to be playful in your mind, right? And that's different for each person. Yeah, and this is, this is and maybe this is the huge, um, the huge tell. And um, I was in uh, France a couple weeks ago for the Ultra Trail Mont Blanc. And I wow. uh, was having a conversation with, I don't remember who. Oh, no, I do remember. That's the guy, the guy I was there crewing for. Uh, so I was crewing for a guy doing UTMB. And he was having this conversation that he had read some study, some psychological study, that something like 80% of what we do is based on what other people think. So, like, the kind of jobs we get, like, the houses we buy, the clothes we wear, the books we read, you know, the foods that we say we like, the wines that, we, you know, we, we pay extra money for, even though, you know, I know, can't tell the difference, you know, but I bought it anyway. 80% is all based on other people's opinions. And that's the problem right there. And only 20% is what you genuinely want, which, of course, is the specially flavored Oreos. You know, it's it's um, it's orange pumpkin spice season for Oreos. I really want this. I'm not going to get them because I'll be embarrassed. So, <laughs> you know, think about that. So maybe that's what goes on. So the person who signs up for an Ironman that doesn't like their, you know, run on pavement or ride a bike in a straight line. The question is, why, why is she doing an Ironman? You yeah. know, maybe she should be doing a, a, a trail half marathon. Like that's going to be her joy in life. Yeah. Or for but some people, because, it might be like the distance, right? Like it seems like a lot of people sign up because Ironman is what everyone's impressed by. But Well, if you say you do triathlon, the immediate question is, oh, have you done an Ironman? Yeah. Versus like a 5k that's quite athletic and difficult, right? Yeah, well, you know, I guess this is one of the, the real downfalls of running is that if you tell anybody that you're a runner, you'll face the question, have you done a marathon? Mm-hmm. Right? And, and what, what time have you done a marathon? And like, person doesn't even, doesn't even run. Like, what do you shit what your time is? And they don't even know what a good time is. And what, actually, what is a good time? You know? Like, so, you're right. That there, there is this arbitrary um, performance standard that enters the conversation so quickly. And instead of, to me, what's really bad is the craft. You know, like, can you get the craft down? You know, you tell someone that you're a painter, they're not going to say, well, did you win? Like, did you win the painting world series? No, I'd say, oh, cool. Let me see, let me see your work. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's funny. I pretty much only started doing the, the trail running or the ultra thing kind of because I wanted to like tick off that distance and it was the first time I ever crossed the finish line where I was actually like smiling and like oh I I enjoyed that whole thing um so you know I do think it takes a while to find that thing that actually feels like play and that feels like fun right I I agree with you and I think you know I think Peter really sort of zeroed in on what the key is like why are you doing this thing why have you chosen this goal and yeah, it could be. Yeah, we. I chose to go not because I want to do it, but because I think it's going to look prestigious, and that is probably a, a dangerous mentality. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, 
Okay, where do I want to go with this next? Uh, so another common thread in the book that I, I'm very excited about is the fact that this book, I think, had more women in it than any of the others. And it's not like the others didn't have women in it, but it seems like women in ultra endurance is, is this topic that's very near and dear to your heart. It, did that happen by accident with this one? Or, did, you know, were you looking for, for women for this? Or how did, how did that come about? It was, you know, it, it was a it was a revelation for me with um, Born to Run. Uh, so again, I was new to the sport. Um, you know, I was not a runner myself when uh, I started researching Born to Run, and definitely wasn't a trail runner or ultra runner. So it was a real eye opener for me, you know, coming out of a traditional sports background, of coming across a sport where man, you know, women kick ass. So they're like mm-hmm. right up there, and. That's when my eyes started opening to the fact, like, oh, you know, when we think about this, actually endurance sports are the only sports that dudes didn't invent. All the other sports that we watch on TV, and men invented them, you know. Uh, we did not evolve playing hockey. We just invented hockey and mm-hmm. baseball and basketball. And so the spectator sports were created by men for men. So it's not like men are genetically, physically superior to women. They are superior in the sports that they created for themselves, you know, <laughs> to, to take advantage of uniquely male characteristics. But, you know, the human animal you know, did not evolve to hit a baseball. The human animal is actually evolved to be a, an endurance creature. Mm-hmm. And the more we do the activities that are natural to our biological makeup as humans, uh, the, the more the differences between men and women just start to diminish. And that's why, you know, uh, right now, you know, who's the first person to swim across the English Channel four times? Well, wouldn't that be a woman, you know? Uh, Do you know about this? It just happened like a couple of days ago. Yeah, you know I that, saw that, that actually. That, it was pretty impressive, yeah. That's it's insanely impressive. So, um, first person to swim, you know, uncaged from Cuba to Florida. You know, would that be a woman? Would that be Diana Nyad? So, uh, that, again, that, was, that was something that I'd never read before, never heard of before. And when I came across it in Born to Run, again, it was an eye opener. Oh, wow, it just changed my perspective. And so once you have that that change of focus, you start to look for it everywhere. Like, hey, well, where, where, where else is this true? And so uh, with Natural Born Heroes, my hands were a little bit tied because I was dealing with resistance fighters on the island of Crete during World War II. And, you know, basically shooting shit for no good reason is pretty much a male-dominated activity. Fair, um, fair. Although there a, were some, a lot of women, there were some really badass women in that that were just kind of um, casually mentioned, and I'm blanking on her actual name, but the mouse um, was one of the resistance fighters. I actually just downloaded yeah. her autobiography, um, and amazing. Yeah, but you know, when it, when it comes to warfare, it's unfortunately uh, or any kind of like violence, it's something the dudes create, and the women are like, oh, well, I guess I got to help out, yep, solve yep. this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, not like they're, it's not like they're instigating it. They're kind of drawn into it against their will. And, uh, but so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was that book. Um, but, you know, again, it's often as possible, particularly with parkour. Again, it's, it's an endurance, agility, adaptability exercise where from a distance, you see two people doing parkour, you can't tell if it's a man or a woman, you know, mm-hmm. that they're performing at the same level. Um, it's as often as possible. I, I looked for those examples to make that point. But yeah, it was with Running with Sherman in particular that I felt like I found like the perfect test case that I was looking for. That you know, you think Barb Dolan and you put her in a burrow race for 29 miles against the fastest, toughest burrow racers in the world, and chances are she's going to kick the crap out of everybody, man or woman. Mm-hmm. Well, and she's she's one of the older racers, and then there were some younger, like very very young women racers who were also it sounded like kind of on their way up in burrow racing. And, yeah, so, you know, it's a funny thing about it. So, burrow racing is its own creature um, because you're combining two challenges. You know, one is your own physical ability, but the other thing is your communion with another creature. And it is interesting to see how young people do really well in the sport. Like this year, a 16-year-old won the Buena Vista, no, a stretch it, a fair play. Yeah, won the fair play race. 16 years old, out of New Jersey. Oh. And uh, this guy, you know, it was Roger Pedretti's nephew. So he's the main character in the book. And 
I've been thinking about that. I think the reason why is because there are these two sweet spots in life where you're not a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> or you, you, you don't have the confidence to be a pain in the ass. It's when you're like a teenager and when you're mature. But when you hit your peak, like in your 20s and 30s, you fucking know it all and you're noisy and you're opinionated. But when you're a teenager showing up in like a bike race, you're kind of like backing off a little bit. Like you want to sort of see what the lay of the land is. Um, and same thing when you're older, like you've, you realize you're on the back nine of your life. So you back off a little bit. And I think that makes you really good with animals. Um, people aren't screaming and yelling and trying to push. They handle animals better. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I have to ask, uh, did you notice any difference between female and male donkeys? Very important question. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's a huge difference, a huge <laughs> difference. And it's, it's actually very problematic. So, there's a thing called an uncut jack. An uncut jack is a male donkey that has not been neutered. And as you can imagine with any like teenage boy, you got a lot of testosterone yeah. running through their veins. And an uncut jack can be really strong and really fast, but hard to handle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think about one donkey is one donkey can fuck up everybody's race. So if you got an uncut jack in the race, it can just cause mayhem for everybody else's donkeys. So, uh, we're at, well, we have, so what we have here, we have two females and a male and, uh, Sherman has been neutered. So he's a, he's a neutered dude. So he's pretty good, but really the leader of the pack is Matilda, who is a, um, a female mini, but she is like the boldest, the toughest, like she's, she's the boss. And, uh, anytime there's like a problem, like if there's like a, a creek you gotta go across, you haven't gone through it before, the other donkeys are nervous, like you just bring up Matilda and Matilda just plows right on through. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, okay, so kind of going away from away from donkeys, but coming back to the book, um what I've what I've generally loved about all of your books is there's always, you know, this main storyline running through it, but then there's all of these little offshoots. So in, you know, Natural Born Heroes, it's parkour and then film affetone and, you know, fat adapted diets and stuff like that. Um, this one has a couple of them. Was there any one aside in this one that was your favorite? Well, there's one that was the most, I thought the most important, and that was dealing with mental health and depression with athletes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I... I with with all the books, there's a there's, there's a point where I feel like I'm on to something really good. With Born to Run, I think it was uh, looking at running shoe technology and and running biomechanics. Uh, it, it's now, I guess, what it's been actually ten years to the year since that book came out. So I feel like that conversation almost feels dated now. But back then, man, it was a conversation that was not taking place at all. And, and I think one of the reasons that Born to Run became well known is because this became like this controversy and, and this debate and, you know, and podiatrists immediately came roaring out of the, out of their caves to, you know, argue that, you know, I was completely wrong and, um, you know, you need orthotics. And, and, and but I think it became a question that people were starting to address for the first time. Like, you know, maybe there's something other than buying new shoes that can change the way I run. And with, um, Running with Sherman, I started to come across two things with mental health that I thought were really important. One was depression, and the other thing were people dealing with like autism or epilepsy or, or other um, setbacks that could be profoundly improved by some kind of communication with animals. Mm-hmm. And so, in both cases, you know, with Born to Run, with the running shoes, I was really, I was really new to this conversation, and I was like, man, I'm not sure. I might be in over my head here, you know, uh, because no, no one else was talking about this, this question about uh, the, the bullshit that the running shoe manufacturers were, were spewing in the market. Uh, you know, whole idea of like change your shoes every 300 miles. That was just gospel, man. That was just that was just a law of nature. Yeah. And I, I wasn't seeing a challenge anywhere, and then I thought, no, it's just it's just completely make believe. It's make believe marketing. But even as I'm writing, I'm like, you know, I, I think I'm right, but I'm not sure I'm right. And with mental health and animals, 
I felt the same bit of apprehension. Like, I'm seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence that this is really important, but there isn't a lot of hard science to back it up. And so I think that's why I felt both excited, like this is really good, and at the same time a little bit of like, okay, I'm, 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 at, the, I'm at the edge of what I can really state scientifically here. Mm-hmm. Um, but we know what, what happened was there, there, sort of, there were two things. That one was looking at the prevalence of acute clinical depression among high-performing athletes, because, you know, again, we're always told sort of the opposite, that exercise is, is an antidote for depression. And yeah. yet, you know, all of a sudden you see, like, you know, Michael Phelps, and, you know, you guys don't know this, but I, you know, spent a lot of time in my room thinking about killing myself. But you don't, you don't, you don't hear that on ABC Why we're all the sports. And then they start to do studies of, you know, elite distance swimmers, high-performing swimmers, and the depression rate is so shockingly high. And so that's where I felt like I was on to something that needed a closer look. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I talked to, we had a sports, or not a sports psychologist, a clinical psychologist on talking about that, because I feel like uh, so many, you know, exercises, the antidote for depression is kind of this common refrain, but what if exercise is part of what's causing you is because you're at that level where you're you know, training so much, whether you're elite or you're just, you know, a regular person, but you're maybe overtrained. Like there's, there's a tipping point there. And there is. And that's something that I think, um, you know, just like the word depression, you know, we start to deal with these terms that are so fuzzy and hard to understand. And it's, I think, you know, one of the most aggravating things with depression is the fact that it's called depression it, because like, Oh, you know, you're, you're kind of sad. Oh, you're depressed. No, dude, I have a mental illness. I yeah. have a serious chemical imbalance which can kill me uh it's it's a it's it's like a cancer of the brain and so but unfortunately because it has this everyday term i don't think people look at it as the serious disease that it it really is Mm -hmm. and and same with exercise you know exercise can mean hey you know 20 minutes of jumping rope versus like two hours of uh, anaerobic threshold uh swimming and these are two very different activities, and they have very different effects. Mm-hmm. And so, did like I, I think we talked about this a bit when you were on last time too, uh, as you were just sort of working through the book and the adventures with the donkeys. But you found um, certainly the exercising and, and playing with animals then is sort of helpful. You know, so here's the thing I was getting at. Again, it was one of these things that should have been obvious to me, but. It took this this jarring experience to actually make me see it. So, you know, for I think I think one of the difficulties in life is that like whatever we're doing today in 2019, you kind of assume that everybody's been doing everywhere throughout time. You know that our experience is kind of universal, dating around the world and back 2,000 years. But it's not. You know what we're doing today is is very particular to the moment. And you know I, I think. I had lost sight of the fact that what we're doing in regards to our community of animals is very, very different than what humans have done for most of existence. For, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, we were always within a few feet of animals all the time. You know, we mm-hmm. relied on them for transportation, for security, for our food. You know, your food was local, so you got your, you know, your dairy from the farmer next door, or you had your own Jersey cow, or you had your own goats, and everybody had a dog, and you understood your dog, and... So animals are all around us all the time. And then relatively recently, like within the past, like, you know, 100, 150 years, we very abruptly severed that relationship and stepped away. And whenever you do that, when you change course on evolutionary history, there's, there are going to be consequences to pay. And, and I feel like we are feeling the consequences now, but we don't know why. So when you have you know, therapy animals and security, security creatures and when you bring like cats into a cancer ward and suddenly um, people's health dramatically improves, there, there's some chemical reaction in our bodies that is hardwired from contact with animals that you can measure and see, but we kind of have forgotten about and don't pay enough attention to. 
Mm-hmm. It's true. I was at the bank yesterday depositing a check, and the one teller walked in with a month old or two month old Australian Shepherd puppy. And as she was processing my check, she just handed me the puppy. And I was like, honestly, you could tell me that my bank account had been drained, and right. I would be totally okay with it right now. <laughs> it was isn't it, isn't it amazing. Crazy? Yeah, oh my gosh. Like, a dog enters the room, and suddenly every head turns. Like everybody wants to check out the dog and pet the dog. And uh, you know, it's funny because you know you, when you see therapy animals, they have to wear like bibs to say, "Please don't pet me," you know, mm-hmm. because the big liability is oh, a dog. Everybody wants to put their hands on it. So, um, you know, you can say, "What's what's the solution?" I don't really know. It's you know, it's I don't want to be in a position of advocating like, "Okay, you're all wrong. You all need a dog today," because that. Could you please be in that either. position? Could you could you just like state that one for the record? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pushing more. I'm pushing more toward goats and donkeys, Molly. I know I hear you, but I think you're one step away from your true destiny. So but there's, there's, there's something there. There's something there that um, I think we, we feel like we have to steamroll ahead in our lives and say, "Well, I don't I have time to walk a dog. I'm not, I have an apartment room. Really, walk a dog." Yeah, there's, there are lots of reasons why you feel like you can't do certain things, and that's cool, but you got to be aware that there's going to be consequences to pay. And so mm-hmm. the person who says, I'm going to do an Ironman, okay, you're going to smash through, even though you hate swimming and you don't really like to ride the bike, you're going to smash through and do it, but there's going to be consequences. You know, you're going to end up either getting injured or being disheartened or, or doing a one and done and never doing it again. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the same thing, too, is that, you know, if we hardwire our lives, so there's no room for the outside world, you know, you, you're going to pay a price for it. Do you think, I mean, I don't want to go too far down this, but the, it's interesting, I think, because I think also endurance athletes probably self-select themselves to be isolated, right? And then it's sort of thinking, oh, no, I, you know, I'm not big on teams. I may be introverted, which Molly and I both sort of cling to that title. But, um, you know, I think sometimes we set ourselves up to be sort of isolated and maybe, I don't want to say predisposed to some of these con- mental conditions, but... Um, we're creating a good like ground for them though. Yeah. And just, you know, everyone's taking things so seriously and it's like, well, you can't go out, you know, and run with someone or walk with someone or, you know, person or animal, I guess, but cause it's not in your training plan. Yeah. And we're all, well, we're individual endurance athletes, right? Why would you go out with someone? You know, it's funny. I, I wrestle with that myself because I, I, preach it and I believe it and I don't do it. Uh, I'll match you head to head right? for introversion. I'll, I'll see you and raise you, you know, because um, I'm in the middle of nowhere and there are periods like when I'm working on the books and my family's away where I'm literally the only person I'll talk to for a week is like the mailman, you know, mm-hmm. so Lauren, Lauren pulls over the package and, hey, Lauren, how you doing? Good, man. How's it Good. Bye. And then <laughs> the only human contact I'll have for an entire week or more. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, so I, I, can't, I can't explain it. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm bringing this down with the search for rationalization. I feel that the communal aspect, the cooperative aspect is crucial. Yeah, I'm in personal daily life. I don't, I don't really practice it myself. Well, you have donkeys, so. Yeah, uh, there's something to that. And maybe, maybe that's my, my substitute is um, having, the thing about it is like, when you do animals, if you're doing it right, then you got to pay a lot of attention. You know, with, with the donkeys, i got to keep an eye on their hooves and have their hooves trimmed every couple of months and check their teeth and their food, their water, um, and their temperament, you know? If they're acting fussy, something's going on, you got to figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. I wonder if just uh, as we're finishing off here, I wonder if someone were interested in burrow racing. We do sort of on this podcast often look at different sports. So if someone sort of... Pe- interest is piqued by this podcast or by reading your book is there like how do you even start into bro racing like is there is there a rental thing molly said she was going to rent a donkey i don't know that that's a, a thing like what would someone do especially if they're not in like colorado where these races are happening you can rent anything uh, uh, we actually, uh, completely right. by the way at this moment i don't know what i mean the sun shifting but all of the animals every single animal we have is now in front of me i feel like <laughs> I feel, like, I feel like Aquaman or something. I feel like the beast match is so right. I got six geese to the right, two goats in front of me, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine sheep in front of me, and the three donkeys. So all this, and one of the cats. One of the cats is like sort of walking around. We're like captive um, audience here. I, 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 I'm usually up here on my, on my balcony. So, very curious question. Yeah, you know, you totally can rent donkeys. So, huh. 
there's a family that I read about in the book, the Juan family, whose son Ben is epileptic, and they again they were they're a suburban Denver family, not country at all. But they heard about equine therapy had helped with epileptics, and they found Curtis Emery, who's a donkey trainer, and they had this magnificent experience with Curtis, and they became a, a hardcore burrow family. They've been that way for like I don't know how many years now, for like ten years. And they actually facilitate a lot of burrow rentals. They're friends with a burrow raiser who's got a farm with a couple dozen donkeys on it. And the ones are the go-to. And actually, a lot of the elite burrow racers are guys who live up in Boulder, men who live in Boulder, and they don't have their own donkeys at all. But they're partners with the ones. So uh, Justin Mock and George Zach will show up at a race, and then the ones will show up at the trailer and leave two donkeys out and hand them over. The race of donkeys is handed back to the ones and you never see them again. Um, so there, there's a now growing uh, population of rental burrows out there available in Colorado. That said, if you can in any way navigate your way to owning your own, it's so much better because then you learn so much from working with the same animal. You can't, even, you can't even articulate it. Now, when people come out and they want to roll with their donkeys, I kind of look at them like, you see all of the mistakes they're making, and you think it's so obvious. Like, why would you be on the right side? Are you crazy? You know, things that of course, I didn't know myself at all when I started now just seem like common knowledge. In your, I just to keep on the training thing, uh, sort of perspective here, what would look, if you did own your own donkey, like, are you running them like 5k a day? Are you doing, you know, I know you really like strides. Are you doing sort of strides with the donkeys? Like what, what does a training day for the donkey or, or as a team, what, what would that look like? That was, that was what was so much fun about this. And, and still is so much fun about it. You know, I think, um, I'm trying to figure out what was actually the driving force. So, one thing about the donkeys, the big, big breakthrough is that no donkey wants to run by itself. They always want to be in a group. And it can be donkey or human group, but they want to be in a herd. And by I'm looking at these three big donkeys right now, they're standing at the gate. This, the entire time we've been talking, they're staring at the gate like, let's go, dude, it's time to go. But, you know, so what happened, Peter, was that, we, so what we did was we quickly escalated from one donkey to three. And that's what made the difference for Sherman was having two other donkeys with him. And so three donkeys means three people. So my wife started to run and then our friend Zeke. So now there's six of us. But what we really found was when someone else, either one of our daughters or anybody else was out in front, uh, going point, then the donkeys were way better. So they have a herd and then someone out there that they can follow. So we, we always recruit anybody, like, you know, my daughter on a bike or a neighbor who wanted to go for a jog. So if our entire team was like seven, three donkeys, three people plus a point person, like that was the dream scenario. And then we just sort of adapted within that. So if we had seven, then we knew we were going to have a good day. We could do some good miles. And, um, and we could also go fast. So, uh, yeah, so if there's my daughter on a bike, she can ride faster than we can run. And so we decided, okay, today's the day we're going to blaze it out. And let's just see if we can do you know, a good, fast seven miles, like, as quick as we can. If that wasn't the case, um, then we just kind of said, well, what, what haven't we done lately? Hey, we haven't done hills like this. Uh, we haven't been in the water like this. Let's take them in the creek. And so the thing was just to throw the variety at them because the more they're interested, the better they're going to go. And so that, that basically became the, the driving factor. We had a, a goal in mind, you know, nine months out, but within that goal, as much as we could change the variety and um, take advantage of what was presenting itself, like that's that's where the way we went. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need yeah. two donkeys, is what I'm hearing, and a goat uh, honestly, and to, a dog. To be honest, <laughs> to be honest from what you guys are describing yourselves, I don't be too preachy. I think it would be perfect. I think, actually, you guys running with donkeys and getting into burrow racing, honestly, honestly, I think you guys have had so much fun. I um, think we would, too. Tony, <laughs> totally, and the other thing about it, which you would love, is the community of burrow racers is it's kind of like, you know, there's that heyday when a sport is new. So remember when mountain biking was just a bunch of ding-dongs and Crested Butte, they were trying to ride to Aspen? It, it was that unknown 
backwoodsy aspect that made it like super cool and fun, you know, before it became like, you know, super technical and, and on television. And same with CrossFit. When CrossFit was just, you know, a, a bunch of people in a parking lot doing it together. And, and so every, and right now, Burrow Racing is in that early, like, Kona stage of Ironman. It was just a couple of guys trying to see if they could do it. So what's cool about Burrow Racing is the community is invisible and yet so cohesive. So I think you guys would just dig it. You'd be a bunch, out with a bunch of weirdos with donkeys in the mountains having fun. I guess we could create Team Canada and yeah. start making it international. Oh, yeah, you know. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think I think you're honest. I, I think it has not cracked, uh, crossed international borders yet, so you could be breaking new ground. I wonder if we could get more like Yukon donkeys, like, but then they probably wouldn't do well in Colorado in heat. Well, I guess it. Yeah, it is in August. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 I honestly don't. I honestly don't know about that because that thing about donkeys is they are desert creatures, so I think they're may, way way more adaptable than mm-hmm. you think. Know, well, you know. Now that you guys kind of got me on to this, that'd be terrific for you guys for next summer. You know, if you guys wanted to do it, do you ever have a chance to spend a good period in Colorado? We've actually, it's funny, I was literally just talking to someone else on a podcast yesterday. Um, my coach lives out in Colorado, and I keep threatening to come out and visit him. So that that might just have to be on the schedule. I don't know how he's going to feel about me adding burrows to the, the situation, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you totally could. You totally could um, if you were there, and then you could pick it up quickly. If you were anywhere around, like Denver, that's where the wands are. They could mm-hmm. take you out a couple times. They show you the ropes, and you could jump into races real quick. I I don't know. That's I think another this... reason that Colorado makes sense, yeah. I guess, for a while at least. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. Well, tell everyone about the new book, what it's called, where to find it, and it's out on October fifteenth, right? Yeah, so it's running with Sherman. By the way, my neighbor's tractor's going by. Oh, this is a pure country scene, and it's, his dog is running in front of him. He's driving the tractor. Yeah, and, oh, if, cool. if you're ever selling um, this farm, just let us know. We'll, we'll figure yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty ideal. He's got this faded old orange tractor. This is something right out of like a 1950s movie. So, um, yeah, running with Sherman. It's coming out October 15th, and I am going to be touring everywhere. Um, really went berserker on schedule. So it's uh, something like 50 different events in 40 different cities. Oh, wow. Uh, where can everyone yeah. find that schedule? It is online on chrismcdougal.com and I'm trying to, you know, cut my teeth on Instagram as well. So uh, I'll be trying to blast it out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting. As always, it's, it's super fun catching up with you and hearing about all of your adventures and getting me excited about getting different animals, wide variety. Need like a starter. Yeah, pack. listen, Miles, if you want to pursue this conversation, I'll, I'll lay in your front against Peter and we'll try and try and wear him down. Yeah, I think I'm going to start a petition with all of the podcast guests we've had on. Well, we I have think... quite a list of Olympians and, and successful people. So thank you for joining that and returning to the podcast, Chris, and for keeping that, uh, for ca- that campaign alive. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, You can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week... Uh, do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.